five vessels. <laughs> oh, wait, I don't even need one of these. I have a pack on my back. <laughs> pack on the back. Pack on the back. Hey. Hey. Amazing. Should I, should I be the next HCFA rap song? Yes, no, yes, no. Yes. 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 Incredible. Wow. Hey, everybody. Hey. No, 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 no. Listen, I grew up in black church. Y'all gotta talk back to me. Hey, everybody. Hey. Yeah, I like that energy. That's a great energy. All right. Wow. Hello. My name is Tyler Parker. I serve here as a ministry fellow for Harvard College Faith in Action. It is amazing to see all you guys tonight. How's everybody doing? Let me hear you say woo if you feel full of energy. Let me hear you say woo if you are absolutely tired. Oh, dang. All right. Well, I, I'll just try to keep the energy high then. Um, man, so good to see all y'all and good to see some of my friends and guests. Hello, guys. Um, man, so cool. I'm really excited to get to chat. Was that a little applause for the guests? I think that's right. You did that. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Okay. Um, I'm really just going to hop straight in because I don't have that much time, and my number one problem whenever I talk is uh, that I go over time. We know. So, I, we know, buddy? Is that what you said? <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay. Um, anyway, so uh, we're talking about uh, being desirable tonight. How desirable is this Fat David statue? Yeah. We love, listen, that, don't answer that question as a matter of fact. Anyway, um, this is, uh, as you may know, this is Michelangelo's David, except uh, somebody adjusted it to be a, a little, well, let's say thicker than usual. Right? A, little, a little more big boned than usual. Um, but uh, it's a really interesting statue because it's this, this statue that uh, is supposed to, for its time, be the archetype of the most beautiful body. And we're gonna talk about that tonight. We're gonna talk about what it means to be a beautiful body. What it means to feel desirable, what it means to align ourselves with an image of what a good body looks like. Uh, but we're gonna do that from the scripture, which is gonna be very interesting. And as, uh, as I've sort of been developing and thinking about what I wanted to say tonight, uh, I kind of stumbled upon this accidentally, like this topic, uh, in just reading uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, which is where we're going to be in our Bibles tonight. If you have your Bible, go ahead and flip to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible, the scriptures will be up on the screen uh, when we get to them. But um, it occurred to me, like, while I was writing, that we actually might touch on some things that some folks here might need healing from. Uh, particularly if you uh, find that you uh, struggle with body image or eating disorders or things of that nature. Uh, and so um, ministry fellows will be here to pray with you. Um, and actually, Teal and Renee have pretty decent experience uh, with dealing with um, body image issues. So if uh, you, as we talk about this, if you find that like you, uh, some things get triggered, feel free to step out or whatever you need to do or text Teal or Renee or just come find Betty and, and he can chat with you. Um, but yeah, I, I, hopefully what God has for us tonight will be a blessing to us and help, help us to heal from things that uh, maybe some of us have experienced uh, hardship from. Amen? Amen. All right, great. So um, let's just get started. My, this may come to a surprise, or it may come as a surprise to all y'all, but uh, I actually have found it really hard uh, to view myself as attractive for most of my life. No, I know. I hear all of you. What? No. <laughs> Stop it. You're beautiful. You're glowing. You look amazing. And that's just what my guy friends sound like. Um, but <laughs> but um, uh, look, I have other qualities that I like a lot. I think I'm really funny. I think I'm smart. I think I'm a good listener. I think I have spiritual gifts. Uh, but I always seem to wish that my body was as cool or interesting as the rest of me. Uh, uh, to give you some examples of stuff that I, I have questions about, I, sometimes I don't really like my teeth. Uh, sometimes I feel like I could just blow away at the next strong gust of wind uh, for being skinny. Uh, I sometimes wish I had a stronger chin, you know? So you ever seen those people with the like sharp... <sighs> Say again? That's a good point, yeah. Everybody's chin, everybody's chin is round with a mask on. That's fair. That's entirely fair. Um, so blah, 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 right? So these are things that I sort of nitpick when I'm in the mirror after I take a shower or whatever. Um, but I actually recently experienced a significant change in how I view my body. 
Uh, and it started when someone uh, noticed my chest, which I actually think is strange, because my, for me, when I look at my chest, I think I look like a sort of plank, you know, just like it goes straight down. It doesn't even like go out, it's just straight down. Uh, it's how my chest is. Um, but uh, this is what happened. Um, I have lots of friends. Uh, some of my friends like to be held, uh, especially when they're have a, having a difficult moment uh, or like a difficult time. So I was uh, holding a friend to comfort him, like right here on my chest. And uh, he said something that I wasn't really expecting. Uh, he said, you know, hey, I really like your chest. And I was like, and how I interpreted that was like, what? Like, that doesn't make any, that doesn't make any sense. What you, it's a plank. You're lying, you're lying on a plank right now is what's happening. It cannot be comfortable. Um, but uh, I'll tell you why he said he liked my chest later. But what it, like, what it was that he actually said made me notice something, and what I noticed led me down the path to writing this talk, uh, talking about is, is my body desirable? So uh, when we talk about the question of if our bodies are desirable, we're actually asking what I think is a body image question. Everybody say body image. Body image. Okay. So we're talking about body image. Look at these uh, strange 3D bases. Okay. Uh, there's actually like uh, someone did a study to determine, like they asked people what their favorite celebrities looked like, and then they averaged all the faces together. And these are the like ideal like facial features that uh, that we're talking about, uh, and that that people sort of came to in this study. Um, and so uh, the first thing I want to draw your attention to is as we talk about body image, and as we specifically talk about image, we're talking about what we see. Okay, that's really important. Um, if you saw, I don't, I mean, I don't know if you saw these people in person, if you would be like, wow, beautiful, because they're 3D, right? But, um, or like, you know, computer renderings of what an attractive person would look like. But, uh, I don't know, I, I, I've seen some of y'all's Instagrams. Uh, some of y'all really like the way that Natalie Portman's eyebrows are. Uh, or some of you really like the way uh, that David Beckham has, you know, oval-shaped eyes. I don't know. Um, but, uh, so these are the things that, that people find attractive about celebrities and uh, maybe as we, uh, some of us who struggle with body image issues, uh, if we do, what we're actually struggling with is what we look like, right, compared to how other people look, right? So when we talk, this is actually really important, you're going to understand why it's important later, but just know that as we talk about body image, we're talking about what we see, okay? Um, there is a, a philosopher named Thomas Nagel. I took a class here um, when I was an undergraduate called Sexual Ethics, which if they still teach this class, all you guys should take it. It's actually really wonderful. Um, but this guy uh, was really interested in what people see. And actually found, he, he thought that how we see is actually really essential to our understanding of desire. Uh, not only what we see, but how other people see us as well. So this is what he says about sexual desire. He, he kind of, his, this guy's a philosopher, so he's going to use fancy language. I'll explain what he means. Um, but uh, essentially, he argues that sexual desire is uh, a sort of complex system of overlapping perceptions. So let me give you an example. Uh, let's say I'm talking about Fetty. Okay. Fetty is a beautiful guy. Everybody, Fetty, stand up and show the people Ooh. you're amazing. Yeah. Fetty, Fetty, y'all, we love Fetty. Okay, I'm using Fetty as an example, right? Okay, so this is how Fetty, uh, sorry, this is how Thomas Nagel would say that desire works. Uh, let's say Fetty and I are sitting at a bar, okay? And I see Fetty and I'm like, man, Fetty has amazing eyes, right? Yeah. But Fetty doesn't notice me, okay? So thus far, we actually don't have any desire. Uh, well, I desire Fetty, but there, it doesn't, it's not reciprocal, so it's not yet complete, okay? Uh, but the second thing that might happen is, you know, I'm taking a long stare at Fetty or something, and then Fetty looks back at me and notices that I notice him, okay? Now, now we have this system of desire happening, and maybe you guys have experienced this when you're like out in the street, right? It's like you notice someone, but they don't notice you back, right? And you, and you like feel the tension of that. And, and maybe that is actually the, the, the foundation of your body image strife, or at least the anxiety that comes 
from how people are attracted to each other, right? It's like, ah, I notice you, but why won't you notice me back, right? And this is, this is like, this is the, the frustration that we experience. So it's, it's particularly the second level of, of attraction that I think that all of us uh, are, are, are yearning for when we're out in public or when we see someone but they don't notice us back. But, but what we do notice uh, is that when someone does notice us, like when someone does notice us back, and particularly when someone notices us back that we notice, right? There's a really powerful experience in that, right? Hopefully all of y'all have experienced this before, but when you, when you see someone staring at you, that you were staring at in the first place, then you realize there's like a mutuality there, and then desire kind of continues to build from there. And because there's an actual mutuality, humans are social creatures, and so we're trying to be social. And Thomas Nagel will go so far as to say, uh, we the first person who was looking experiences what he calls a sense of embodiment. In other words, you feel seen. You feel like not like an object, but you feel somehow more human when someone that you notice notices you better. <coughs> and so the question of am I desirable could actually be reformulated as the question, does anyone notice me back? So how do we try to fix our body image issues or our noticing issues? Well, we do things to get noticed, right? We might wear certain clothes, we might wear certain makeup. My guys, we might spend hours in the gym trying to get the washboard. Not the plank, the washboard, right? Uh, we might spend hours looking at ourselves in the mirror. Maybe some of y'all don't, don't spend hours. But actually, what, what probably happens is if you counted up all the time that you looked in mirrors over the course of the day, it might end up being hours. Mm, that's kind of awkward. Um, but, right, so we do things to get noticed. Here's a, here's a pretty significant thing. We might spend a lot of time focusing on how we eat or what we eat in order to change our weight, right? Or change the, the proportions or whatever of our body. Why? Because we want to be noticed. We want to be noticed by the people who notice us. Or sorry, we want to be noticed by the people that we notice, right? We want that mutuality. We want, we want the feeling of like, ah, I need to know that someone desires me. And so what we end up doing is obsessing. Uh, and we obsess in two ways. We obsess in a negative way and a positive way. In, a, in the negative way, we might spend a lot of time thinking about the fact that no one finds me desirable. Nobody notices me. So for some reason, I seem, this happens to me a lot, actually. When I go out in public and I see all the folks around Harvard Square and I'm like, ah, I notice that guy, I notice that lady, I notice this person, I notice that person. Uh, and no one's looking back at me. Right? No one else is kind of captured by what I'm wearing. Nobody else is captured by my eyes. Nobody else is captured by, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, or we obsess positively about being desirable. We spend a lot of time uh, on Instagram, on Facebook, on TikTok, kind of analyzing other people's bodies, trying to figure out what we want for ourselves. And then we go into the gym or we go into the dining hall and we get after it. Right? We put in a lot of work to, to be desirable. Or maybe you're the kind of person uh, who really longs to be desired, but you just find you don't have the willpower to do anything about it. And so you just kind of sit in stress or anxiety or frustration. Because at the end of the day, we all just want to be noticed. So we conform ourselves to certain images in order to get noticed positively. Because it matters <clears throat> the way that we get noticed, right? Like we don't want to be noticed for like scars on our body or like something that seems like abnormal about our body. We want to be noticed for the right reasons. So um, what ends up happening is that we try to conform ourselves to standards, body image standards or body image ideals, okay? The question is, whose images are we conforming ourselves to? On Instagram, we might find, and the reason I keep bringing up Instagram is because there was some data that came out in the last two weeks 
that indicated from Facebook's own internal research that Instagram makes body image issues worse for at least one out of three teenage girls. At least, right? This is their internal data, so they have like they have reasons to undersell uh, the amount of people that body image issues are made worse for. And so, like, who do we want to look like? Is the question. Are, do we want to look like <clears throat> the Instagram models? Do we want to look like the people in those uh, perfume commercials where they don't say anything but they like look at each other and then they hop into an ocean and they come out wet and then it's like splash <laughs> the fragrance or whatever, right? <laughs> maybe maybe what we think of as attractive is actually deeply influenced by the culture we live in, right? Uh, that if you go back, um, whoever's doing slides, if you could go back to the, the faces, yeah, like. These are the celebrities that the people came up with, but if this is supposed to be the ideal face, that means that the ideal person's face has like slightly full lips, has white skin, brown hair, this particular nose. I can't tell what color the eyes are, but like a specific color of eyes, right? And if you went to, you know, Rwanda or uh, oh. Japan, right? <laughs> was somebody from Rwanda in here? Shut up, shut up, shut up. Let's go, Brave. If you went to some of, one of those other places, people might be like, this is your ideal? What's going on there, right? So it's really important to notice that the images that we try to conform our own bodies to in order to be noticed, in order to be seen, those images are deeply culturally uh, uh, constructed, right? That like, literally in the 90s, there were like the most beautiful models that existed were uh, in the style of fashion called heroin chic. And yes, heroin, not in the terms of like, this woman is a hero, but actually like a person that looked like they were on heroin, okay? It's like they had sunken eyes, they were like really, really thin. This like, the, the modeling industry was kind of uh, racked by these scandals of, of, of models experiencing eating disorders and stuff like that in order to like fit some beauty standard, right? And today, the ideal woman is in, in the West is somebody like Kim Kardashian. It's like completely different, right? And so these, these image standards, they're not like giving you like eternal kind of understandings of what's beautiful. They're giving you deeply culturally conditioned understandings of what is beautiful, right? right? So where do we look to figure out what's actually beautiful? <laughs> we'll get to it. Here's, here's another thing that's really important to note is that no one's exempt from this. We actually even conform God to the beauty standards of our age. If you notice uh, religious art throughout different time periods, right, people tend to conform religious figures and even representations of God himself to the beauty standards of that age, which the folks in the Old Testament would have deep issues with, right? They'd have deep issues because the, like, the first or the second commandment says, you shall make, you shall make no graven images of the Lord your God, right? So it's like, for some reason, the folks in the Old Testament had this deep internal anxiety or this deep internal rejection of the idea that God would be made in the image of our age in accordance with the beauty standards of our age. Uh, and here's just like a fun side note, is that the word image uh, is actually the same word like in the Old Testament, the same the word that's the Hebrew word for image is the same word for idol. Um, and uh, idols go in temples. Uh, people would like kind of make these graven images and put them in temples as physical representations of the deity. But for Hebrews, they like refused to do that. They said our God is not represented by graven images that go in temples. He's represented by something else. Uh, the last thing I want to say on on kind of this body image situation that that we live in here in the Western culture is uh, there's something called the body positivity movement. Have you guys heard of this? Yeah. yeah. So the body po and that, so here's the thing, right? Folks in our culture, even secular culture, recognize that there's something deeply <laughs> intrinsically wrong with the way that we think about body image. Uh, they recognize that most of the time people are kind of basing their self worth on appearances, uh, and this movement sort of seeks to. Uh, recognize the diversity of bodies uh, and, and, and encourages people to adjudicate 
uh, the goodness of their body on something like health, which I think is a, a good goal. Uh, the problem with the body positivity movement, which again, has really great aims and, and desires, but the issue is that this movement actually mostly exists on Instagram, which is a visual platform, right? So it's a movement that desires to help you not judge people based on appearances, right? But then the way that they get their posts seen on Instagram, like via the algorithm, is to like present their bodies in a way that draws more attention to their appearance, right? And so it's been it's sometimes criticized for this kind of contradictory uh, principle. Uh, it's like in order to be seen on Instagram, you have to post an image that will get you what noticed, right? So here is the fundamental question before us that we're going to look to the scripture to answer. Is there a healthier approach to the image I present to the world? Or better put, for what am I to be noticed? Say that with me. For what am I to be noticed? Let's check it out. Um, let me pray real quick. Lord... Help us to see in your scripture why we, why we ought to be noticed and, and what our body's for. And uh, show us, Lord, what you see in us and what you see in our bodies. We love you. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Next up, we're going to read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, we're going to read verses 13 through 20. Scripture says, For food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord, and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes <coughs> one body with her? For, as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with Christ. So, glorify God in your body. To understand what's happening in this passage, we need to talk a little bit about what is happening in the Corinthian church. And by the way, that scripture is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 13 through 20. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 13 through 20. Uh, Paul is writing a letter to this church in Corinth. Uh, and the folks at Corinth, he has like some good things to say about them and some bad things to say about them. Uh, the good thing is that these are folks who are really seriously invested in spirituality. Like they want to grow closer to God. They want to grow uh, spiritually in spiritual knowledge. They like, you know, are all gung-ho about the gospel. It's just that the way that they're gung-ho about the gospel is kind of a little wrong. Uh, they, they take after some of the like, Kind of, it's a Roman colony. They take a little bit after some, some of the Roman practices in the day. And there are some philosophers in the area who sort of think, uh, your body's kind of nasty. Uh, your body has these urges, these like sexual urges. Those actually get in the way of you uh, understanding your proper relationship with God. So uh, the reason that Paul's talking about prostitutes here is that there's some people in the Corinthian church who, in their pursuit of spirituality, say, I need to just get, I, like, I recognize that my sexual urges are, like, in the way. This thing that my body is doing, which is, like, desiring other people, that's getting in the way of my spirituality. My desire is getting in the way of my spirituality. So what I need to do is just go have sex with a prostitute, get it out of my system, and then I can come back and, like, be focused in church, right? To us, to our ears today, that sounds like, the heck? Like, what do you mean? What, what happened there? That, that somehow we went really wrong, right? Um, but at the time, this wasn't just like what they believed in Corinth. This is like what every man in Roman society was expected to do, right? Women were expected to uh, reach marriage uh, and be a virgin the whole time, like, like up until like you actually get married. Men were absolutely not expected to do that. In fact, it was like encouraged that men like 
get their sexual desires like out, like uh, you know, so you can focus on stuff that really matters. Because apparently women weren't supposed to focus on stuff that really matters. Roman society, of course. Okay. So um, the problem here uh, that Paul diagnoses is that the Corinthians see their bodies and they see other people's bodies and they don't think of their bodies as sacred. Okay. They think that their bodies are just for pleasure, uh, to make space for uh, real spiritual gain. In other words, they, they think, you know, I'll just get this pleasure out of the way, I'll just get this kind of fleeting desire out of the way, uh, so that I can get to the real spiritual stuff, which has nothing to do with my body. Um, and the way that that relates to us today is that if you think that your body is just for pleasure, or if you think that your body's kind of nasty, and it's like an impediment, like it's a barrier to you growing closer to God, then Paul would actually say that you don't really understand desire, and you don't really understand your body. You don't really see your body the way God sees it. And so this is what Paul says about uh, our bodies, how God views our bodies, right? Not just how he thinks about it, but how God views our bodies. He says, do you not know that your temple, or sorry, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? That means that God made a deliberate choice to give the Holy Spirit to you and to, to call your body a temple. The reason that that's important actually goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. So I'm going to try to do like a really quick run over of the book of Genesis and I, Caleb's kind of glaring at me because he's like, mm -hmm. yeah, he's smiling. Okay. He's like, I don't know, Tyler, when he goes to Genesis, it's always like, I'll be quick, and it's never quick. But here we go, right? So a helpful definition of what a temple is is just a place where the divine and the human meet. Okay, That's like the point of any temple in the Old Testament. It's just a place for the divine and the human to meet, for God and humans to meet in the same space. Whatever the space is called, it's called a temple. And so the first temple that was ever uh, recorded in Scripture is actually the Garden of Eden. So in the Garden of Eden, God is like walking around with human beings, and, and human beings are kind of mediators of God's presence to all the rest of creation. So that would make human beings priests. So because what priests do is they like help human beings and like help the rest of creation experience God's presence. And so that's actually how God created human beings to be. Uh, he made them in his what? In his image, okay? So human beings are actually supposed to look like God, and as other uh, creatures in the world look at, look at human beings, they're supposed to see God, right? And so in that way, human beings are a mediator of God's presence to the rest of the world. But that's, only, that's literally like we're, we're like having the time of our lives for like two chapters in the Bible, right? Literally, like, the first two chapters, we're like, wow, God made us priests and, and kings, and we have dominion, and it's amazing. And then literally, chapter three, we lose all of it, right? Yeah. Uh, and the reason that we lose all of it is because uh, a serpent comes up, and he's like, did God say you can't eat the fruit? And we're like, nah, well, yeah. And then we're like, well, the serpent's like, you should listen to me. And then we go, okay. And then we, like, take the fruit, <laughs> right? Uh, and then God has to actually move us from the Garden of Eden. Right? Our sin makes us uh, unqualified to be in the presence of God. So for our safety, as a matter of fact, God has to remove us from his presence. Because God's presence is holy, right? And holiness is a little bit like the sun. If you're the same substance as the sun, like hyperheated helium, great. Just join the sun and you'll be in a big ball of hyperheated helium. But if you're not hyperheated helium, you will have much trouble with the sun, right? So, uh, so that's what happens to human beings. For our safety, we're removed from the Garden of Eden. And then later, that's just the first three chapters of the Bible. And for the rest of the Bible, God is trying to restore the connection between the divine and the human. And so you get all these temples, all these spaces in the Old Testament where God is trying to put the divine and the human back together. So the tabernacle that he tells Moses to build, and the first temple, and the second temple, all these temples are meant to be spaces where human beings can be cleansed of their sins so that they can experience the presence of God. 
And then, in the New Testament, God does something strange. He does something weird. He doesn't tell human beings to build a building. He actually does a thing called incarnation, which means that the scripture says that uh, in this person, in a human being, all the fullness of the deity dwell. And so the divine and the human are together in one body, and that body is called? Jesus! Yay! You guys passed every Sunday school ever. Congratulations, right? So, so, the, so the body, right, a human body actually becomes a temple, right? A human body becomes the mediator of God's presence to other people. So that any time that a human being is healed by Jesus, or any time a human being lies on Jesus' chest, or any time that a human being laughs with Jesus after Jesus tells a joke, or something like that, they are experiencing God through Jesus' body. Right? Now here's the real kicker. Is that Jesus is not the only temple that God created. As a matter of fact, because Jesus uh, decides to send us the Holy Spirit, Paul makes the radical claim that those who belong to Jesus, those who follow Jesus into death and resurrection, uh, those people also are temples of the Holy Spirit. In other words, every single person in this room who belongs to Jesus is a carrier of God's presence. And that that is what your body is for. Can we go back one scripture? That's like not an accident, guys. And it's also not just this like heady spiritual reality. Check this out, right? So the scripture says uh, in verse 16, For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. Where is that from? <coughs> right, it's from Genesis, right? And it's particularly from the part that's about what it's like for a man and woman to join themselves in marriage, right? The two will become one flesh, right? Uh, the scripture particularly is, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave or hold fast to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. What do we think that that's about? Sex. Sex, that's right. Thank you. It's about union. It's about the union of two fundamentally different bodies, two bodies with different natures coming together, to participate in union with one another. Watch this. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. That word, joined to the Lord, is actually the exact same word as cleave between a husband and wife. And so I think that what Paul wants you to know is that not only does God, like, not only does God like, not only has he put his spirit in you, but he desires your body as it is for that purpose. He's filled with passionate desire for your body today, right now, as it is for that purpose. Not only is God filled with passion to be close to you, he's passionate for union with you. To literally fill you with his presence. Right? To put something which wasn't there into you. So it said it's there now. Right? And I know it sounds a little bit awkward, but like, the scripture is utterly, like the scripture is really shy about sexual language at certain points. Like it goes, Adam knew his wife. <laughs> right? <laughs> but in so many places in the Old Testament, the scripture is absolutely explicit that the relationship between God and his people is not like God is my boyfriend, God is my girlfriend. It is God is my spouse. God is the spouse of Israel, right? The husband of Israel. And Israel has been fundamentally unfaithful, but God continues to cleave to his people, continues to radically desire them, continues. We sing a song called Reckless Love. It's this idea of like a furious, passionate desire that God has for his people. And that's true of you. And why does God desire why, why does God desire your body? Because He means to save the world through it, right? He, like there's so many people out on our campus and out in the world 
who have not experienced God's presence, who believe that God does not exist because they've never felt him. And do you know that it is God's preference that God chooses to have those people experience his presence, not by riding in the sky, not by doing some crazy miracle, but he prefers to have them experience his presence through you. Amen? So here's the point. God's, God really furiously desires my body. Like, he likes it. God is actually really jazzed about my body. He's like jazzed about my teeth. He's jazzed about my chest. He's jazzed about my legs. <laughs> Thanks, God. And where my beauty actually really lies is not in these temple decorations that fade, right? My clothes, which I probably won't have for like another year. I'm not very good at keeping up with clothes. Um, or not with like, you know, getting in the gym and getting super cut, because at some point in my life, I'm gonna be like 70, 80, <coughs> and then like, I, I probably won't be able to get into the gym as much, right? Or my skin will start to get a little saggy. And this happens, this is like universally true. Sorry guys, I don't know if you know, your skin will get saggy at some point. Right? And that's like, that's a fundamental truth, right? That even the book of Proverbs says that beauty fades, right? But the fear of the Lord lasts forever. The word of the Lord lasts forever. So we spend so much time, and the folks on our campus spend so much time trying to dress ourselves and make ourselves beautiful so that we can get noticed with temple decorations that fade, not knowing that the beauty which persists, something of eternal beauty, is when we adorn ourselves with God's beautiful spirit. Because being with God is what makes me beautiful. Thank you, thank you. Let me give you an example of this. You know how, like, I don't, I don't know, if people don't really talk about this that much, but you know, like, you know when, like, there's somebody, like, in your group or whatever, or, like, your friend group, and you're like, eh, I don't really think they're that hot. But then, like, then somebody else has a crush on them, or, like, then somebody else, like, you know, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Somebody else has, like, a crush on them, or somebody else starts dating them, and it makes you go, like, hmm, well, maybe I was wrong, right? <laughs> so, like, people somehow, I don't know what this is, but somehow people tend to look more beautiful when, when you can see that other people desire them. Imagine how you'd look if other people could see how much Christ desires you. How much Christ is with you, right? So here are the implications of, um, of, uh, of, of, of what it means for me to be a temple that God means to unite with. Uh, in the last scripture, can we go like one more? Yeah. So Paul says, uh, you are not your own for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Uh, I always thought that this was really interesting, glorify God with your body, because I keep hearing from folks that like God, like every time you see a no in the Bible, it's accompanied with like a some kind of positive yes, right? And so what I see here is don't sleep with prostitutes. And by extension, like, because Paul's gonna say in chapter seven, like if you have sexual desires, you should get married, right? Um, or if you burn with sexual passion, you should get married. Um, so what I read from this traditionally was like, you know, don't have sex with prostitutes, don't have sex outside of marriage. And I never really understood, like, what, okay, so I'm not supposed to, like, you know, act on my sexual desires in that way. What do I do? What's the accompanying yes? The yes is glorify God in your body. And here's the crazy thing. The word glorify, right, in this Greek context, actually means to make God seen, right? To make God noticeable. To be noticed by the God in you. Okay? So, this is what it means. This is the yes for me, according to my body. Right? Uh, is that I'm meant to allow God to be seen through my body. That I'm most beautiful when people see God working through me. But, what, what also seems to be true, I hear some of you in the audience going like, Yeah, okay, fruit of the Spirit, like... Ray, adorn myself with the fruits of righteousness, yay. But I still struggle with the feeling that nobody notices me, right? The thing that I want to communicate to you tonight, the thing I want, if you don't leave with anything else, what I want you to know is this. 
the almighty God of the universe, notices your body. And he says, and he wants you to know. He, wants, he doesn't just want you to like read this in the scripture and then just like have it bounce off you. He wants you to know this in your innermost being. That you're beautiful and lovely and wonderfully made. And that he desires your body. And he desires union with your body. So that you might give birth to spiritual transformation in your life and in the lives of other people. So how do I tap into the feeling that God notices me? How do I tap into what God feels about my body? I have maybe like two really quick examples. Um, one of them was earlier when I was talking about how I was holding my friend, and he said he liked my chest. And I asked him, I, I said that I was going to say like what it was that he said to me that kind of changed the way I thought about this. So I asked him, like, what is it that you like about my chest? And he said, <sighs> he said, I feel safe here. He said, I feel God's peace lying here. And when we were done, I, I sort of remember, like, I had to go pee or something, whatever. And then I, like, looked at myself in the mirror, and I was like, chest ain't half bad. <laughs> <laughs> and that was crazy, because it's the exact same feeling that I get anytime somebody's like, I really love the outfit that you have on today. But it was like, there was some, something more weighty about it. It was like, oh, like, this is what my body is for. Like, this is how I look beautiful. It's like when I actually am able to transmit something of God through my body. It's actually insane. I, another example of this for me is um, whenever I'm doing evangelism. Evangelism is like one of my spiritual gifts, and it's like one of these things that I love to do. But, like, I don't, I, I don't know if anybody else experiences this when you practice your spiritual gifts, but, like, when I, there's this moment when I'm like, somebody else is right across from me, and I, and we're having this like tussle back and forth. It's like, I'm like, you know, God's real. They're like, no, he's not. And I'm like, you know, whatever, back and forth. We're going apologetic, physics, whatever. Uh, and the Holy Spirit at a certain point just gives me the exact right thing to say. And I know it's the right thing to say. So I'm just like waiting for them to finish talking. So I can like give them like what the Spirit needs them to hear. And then I say the thing, and then there's this moment of silence. Because, like, exactly what I said is the exact thing that God wanted to, like, hit their heart. And I never feel more powerful than in that moment. I, I never feel sexier than in that moment. I don't know how to say it. I don't know how to say it. it it's, it's just that, like, it's this sense that, like, oh, man, God wants to, like, give somebody eternal life through my mouth, like, through, through what I say to them right now, yeah. right? Yeah. And then when I, when I, like, let God use my body, when I let God uh, 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 move through me into another person, just the, the union and the connection and the, like, strength and the power that I feel flowing through me is absolutely nuts. Wow. And it, it fills me with so much confidence, and it makes me so grateful to have a body at all so that I can speak to this other person, so that God would prefer, this gracious God that we have would prefer to use me to offer somebody eternal life. Mm -hmm. That's good. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. So, we obsess over our bodies and we turn them into idols sometimes. And so, if, if this conversation has been triggering for you in terms of like, you know, okay, Tyler, like, I want to tap into that feeling, but I, I actually have like a really serious body image issue or a really serious eating uh, situation. Um, what I will say is that the scripture says you are a temple of the Holy Spirit, but that language is plural, as a matter of fact. It's like, it's, there's this language play between body and bodies, and so it's not only that we individually are the body of Christ, but like together as a group, we're the body of Christ. We're a place where people can come experience God's healing presence, and so if you are someone who needs healing uh, from a body image issue, that's what this community is for. Right? And so, we want you to talk to, uh, again, Renee has like pretty extensive experience in helping folks deal with uh, body image issues. I think Teal has a decent amount of 
uh, uh, experience as well. And so we invite you to talk to either one of those. If, uh, when we do the connection card, you can write on your connection card um, that, that you might need help for that. Um, and so if we could tap into a sense of God's daily desire for our bodies, we, we might feel less of a need to work and to change our body just to be noticed. Um, but this is a daily practice. It's not like one day God just shows you how he feels about your body and then you go, okay, I never need God anymore. Um, for me, this is like a daily discipline of like going to God, asking him to show me what he sees in my body, and then kind of choosing to believe what he says. Um, because there's nothing really worse than like, I don't know if y'all have ever dated or if you have like friends that you, you like really want them to know like how beautiful they are, but they like, there's something in them that just refuses to let them believe it. I think so many of us like do that with God, right? So we, God like furiously wants us to know how beautiful we are. And for some reason we, we just can't believe him. So that's the kind of thing that we all need healing from, and, and uh, we'd love to pray for you for that. Um, so with that, I'm going to pray, and then we'll maybe take, like, if anybody has any questions, I can not do that. <laughs> Great. Uh, if, you, if you have any questions, you can uh, talk to me afterwards. Um, but yeah, let's just go ahead and pray. Father, thank you for my brothers and sisters. Thank you that you love us beyond our imaginations. Um, thank you that you desire our bodies, that you care for us deeply. Um, Lord, I pray that there, if there's anybody in this room right now who hates certain parts of their body, uh, who maybe hates their body entirely, um, who finds it difficult to believe it when the scripture says that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, um, who is finding it difficult to hear your words to them that they're so lovely tonight. Lord, I pray that you would help them to offer those parts to you so they can hear your sweet words of affirmation and your sweet compliments to them. Um, I pray, Lord, that whatever stands in the way, we rebuke it, send it back to the pit of hell where it comes from. Lord, we pray that your spirit would begin the work of healing the broken ways that we see our bodies tonight so that we can be utterly receptive to the filling of your spirit, to the giving of your spirit to us, so that we might give your spirit to other people. We love you, Lord God. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Thanks, y'all. Yeah.